Hey, everyone. Ready to have your minds blown? Look at this picture. What do you think it is? A snake? Uh-uh. A legless lizard? Nope. A worm? Not even close. This, my friends, is a special little amphibian called a Sicilian. Yes, you heard me. Amphibian. Have I blown your minds yet? Well, if not, there's plenty of time left over to do so. Hello, animal lovers. Welcome to the Zoology Girl channel and to another episode of the series Species Summary. I am your host, Straw Bebe, and today we'll be entering the wacky world of these amphibian noodles with an individual species called the Mexican Sicilian. Let's get started, shall we? You'd think something so strange would have a really complicated taxonomy, right? Well, actually, you'd be wrong. Like the mammals we covered, the important taxonomy is a pretty short and straightforward list. The class is Amphibia, which I'm sure you can guess is the class of amphibians. The subclass is Lysamphibia, which is all modern amphibians. Huh? Why make the distinction, you ask? Well, I feel it's important because of how long amphibians have been around to distinguish them from those that lived hundreds of millions of years ago. There is a huge gap in evolutionary time right there, but it's easy for one to look at Ichthyostega or another early amphibian and say, oh, that's just a giant salamander. It must be the close relative of the giant Chinese or giant Japanese salamander. When actually it's about as closely related to them as it is to us, which as you can guess is not very closely related at all. So that's why it's important to make the distinction. The order, Gymna Fiona, is what encompasses all Sicilians, no matter what part of the planet they exist on, as well as extinct species that became Sicilians. Despite looking very similar to each other, the individual families of Sicilians are genetically very diverse from each other due to split-off points in evolutionary history, so we can't just lump them all into one family. With a trained eye, however, you can fairly easily separate them into different families if you recognize distinguishing traits. The Mexican Sicilian's family is Dermo Fidei, which is a common Sicilian group. These guys are mostly found in Central and South America, but also some parts of Africa, and some notable traits of the group include lack of tail, as well as the tendency to give birth live in moist soil or to air-breathing juveniles rather than directly in water. Dermophis is its genus, and there are seven species within it in total, including the Oaxian Sicilian, the Slender Sicilian, and our boy, the Mexican Sicilian, along with a few others that don't have common names. Finally, its species name is Mexicanus, because it's the Mexican Sicilian. The Mexican Sicilian can be found in many different areas around Central America, from southern Mexico down to Nicaragua, and is on the larger sides of Sicilians. They're carnivores, mostly feeding on invertebrates such as slugs and snails with little needle-like teeth. Males can get huge, up to two feet in length. Sicilians in general live in tropical areas, but unlike most amphibians, these guys are not bound to live super close to a body of water. They live in moist soil, allowing them to keep their skin moist so they can breathe without returning to a water source regularly. Yes. You heard me. They breathe through their skin. They let the oxygen passively diffuse across their thin skin and into their bloodstream. A lot of amphibians actually do this. There are even some salamanders that got rid of their lungs altogether while still living on land. But we'll cover them some other time. These guys do have lungs, but they so rarely need to use them that it's a rare find to see one leave the ground for fresh air. They spend most of their time underground, digging around like worms, and even moving the same way as them, what's known as concertina movement. And yes, it is named after the tiny accordion thing. Use that as a way to remember it. They can move this way due to the muscular rings that make up their body, called annular rings. It gives them their wormy appearance. Their eyes are actually super small due to their subterranean lifestyle, making them pretty much useless. A lot like moles. Some Sicilians have them missing altogether or are subdermal. So how do they know where they're going, you ask? The answer to that, my friends, is simple. Tentacles! Yes, you heard me right. These guys have little itty bitty tentacles on the front of their nose that help them to feel around their environment. See, there they are. Sicilians are the only amphibians to have them. Think that's weird? Wait until you hear what I have to say next. None of that thing is tail. None of it. It's all head and torso. How do we know? 
Well, it's a matter of figuring out where the digestive tract ends. If any part of the axial skeleton stretches beyond the digestive tract, that's a tail. That's actually a trick you can use to figure out the difference between a legless lizard and a snake. Long tail, it's a lizard. Little tail, snake. Anyways, I'm getting sidetracked again. Let's get back on topic, shall we? So after all this craziness, you might be wondering, how can this thing get any weirder? Simple. It gives birth to live, fully metamorphosized juveniles. Yes. It does literally everything an amphibian is not supposed to do, and yet we still call it one. It's like the amphibian is trying to evolve into a mammal again, but skipping a few details like thick skin or being warm-blooded. The eggs grow and hatch inside the mother, feeding on excretions they scrape off from a special gland in her body. And we're going to stop there because I'm getting way too excited about this junk, and so this segment has gone way too long, and my crew is telling me to cut away now. Anyways, she gives birth to these little three-inch Juveniles. Very cute in a wormy way. Also, these things don't have bone marrow and produce blood in their kidneys. Jesus Christ, these things are freaking weird. I could literally go on for hours. Let's go on to behavior before I'm tempted to. These animals are solitary and almost never interact with humans, staying underground for much of their lives. This means we don't know a whole lot about their behavior, but one interesting thing about them is their social behavior is almost all based in smells. I mean, I guess it should be obvious, seeing as they're nearly blind and sound gets pretty muffled underground, but whatever. Things like locating a mate and identifying each other is pretty much all based on them laying down tracks of pheromones advertising their ability for each other to follow until they find one another. The predation strategy is similar to many snakes in that it's a sit and wait strategy as they lunge at them from their burrows. Sometimes they will come to the surface when it's cool like dusk or dawn, but it's hard to really tell if these creatures are truly nocturnal slash diurnal. Because, you know, hard to come across a sleeping one since they tend to do that under the ground. Another time they might come up is during a rainstorm, usually to catch the worms who come up after the storm as well. Sicilians have been around for millions of years, but the earliest fossilized remains for this species dates back to about 1300 BC. The species was first described scientifically in 1841, though it was probably known before then by natives. Local names for the animal include Tapaocua and Cecilia Mexicana. Ecologically speaking, the Mexican Sicilian has played a somewhat important backstage role in human civilization and its habitat. Like worms, they help churn the soil, but also keep plant destroying pests from destroying crops, like termites. Although many amphibians are suffering from the fungal epidemic that has been plaguing the world and killing off many salamander and frog species at an alarming rate, on top of habitat loss, Mexican Sicilians are actually doing pretty good. Their old habitats are being cleared for farmland like many other species of amphibians, which is harmful, but isn't really affecting them too much in some respects. If it's replaced by coffee farms, specifically that have organic compost, they have found a niche for hunting invertebrates through the compost heat. While still listed as vulnerable due to habitat destruction, that's leagues better than many other amphibians today, particularly in the areas in which they live. And is just another way I guess this strange little amphibian proves itself to be remarkable. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider subscribing or supporting me on Patreon. If you want to join a community on studying a bunch of different sciences and topics, consider clicking the invite link to the study Q&T Discord in the description below. But most importantly, have a wonderful day.